Um, thank you very much for everyone to come today. Uh, my name is, uh, you can call me Jen Zhang for short. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Mecca. I'm also part of the Center for Culture and Technology, which is the organizer of this talk. Um, so it's my honor to share my PhD research with you. Uh, so my PhD is about uh, digital self-representation of Chinese migrants. Um, in such an era when digital use is so pervasive, um, I try to look at uh, what digital self-replication can provide to Chinese migrants. So specifically, I look at the practice, uh, media production practice of digital storytelling in which uh, migrants can share their stories in digital means. Um, so first, I want to introduce what digital storytelling is. It, uh, digital storytelling is a practice um, of media production invented in 1990s. At that time, there was an ongoing community arts movement uh, in the United States. Um, so it was invented by two filmmakers based in California um, who wanted to, uh, wanted to change the status quo of uh, people using arts for self-expression. Um, they believed that the ability of self-expression was a central literacy for social participation. But at that time, uh, the ability to uh, express oneself through arts and the uh, uh, right to self-expression through arts was uh, largely controlled uh, by professional artists and uh, uh, artistic authorities. So they designed this uh, digital storytelling workshop to put uh, media experts uh, with lay people who are not very familiar with digital creation. And they let the experts help um, lay people uh, to create their uh, short videos based on personal experience. So. After they established the Story Center to promote this practice, uh, they found uh, the practice very empowering for different social groups, but mostly in the Western societies. So the practice has been used for advocacy and commercial purposes uh, uh, during the past two decades. Uh, it has been taken up by activists in uh, of for various uh, social groups. It has already also inspired industrial um, innovation. For example, an app uh, for tourism in China was inspired by the idea of digital storytelling. So in the 2009 book, A Story Circle, Professor John Harley and Kelly McWilliam called digital storytelling kind of a social movement. So digital storytelling has been used for research uh, it has grown into an interventional tool to explore the democratization potential of digital narratives uh, for various social groups. Um, for example, uh, Melbourne-based uh, researcher Joe Tachi went to Southeast Asian countries to use digital storytelling to lift up poverty in those uh, local communities. And uh, Queensland-based uh, researchers uh, explored the potential of digital storytelling to give a voice to women in Turkey and uh, to LGBT groups in Australia. So researchers used to be really celebratory about digital storytelling in those discussions. However, in recent years, there has been an increasing trend to you know, look into the complexities of having a voice through digital storytelling. Um, UK-based researcher uh, Nancy Sudman, for example, looked into the BBC digital storytelling project and uh, found that, like many other technology uses, digital storytelling is also a site of power struggle. So there has been tensions formed in the institutional aspect, the textual aspect, and cultural aspect of the practice. 
And uh, another researcher, Nick Caudry, believed that uh, if not conducted uh, appropriately, digital storytelling can well become a practice which is isolated and inconsequential. And the digital stories might be just re be retelling the template dominant stories of the society. So um, the researchers start to be more cautious towards the practice. So when I, because I am very interested in the migration activities of Chinese people um, in China and uh, overseas, so I, I was curious uh, if digital storytelling can provide opportunities for Chinese people on the move uh, to have a voice. And uh, if there are these opportunities, how Chinese people on the move would take up these opportunities? And uh, if there aren't those opportunities, so why would this be? And uh, so I conducted the workshops in both countries, Australia and China, uh, with uh, Chinese international migrants and uh, internal migrants. And I set the theme as stay, uh, because stay, uh, translated in Chinese as Ting Liu, is a very neutral word. It can be short, it can be long, it can be about not living in a place, it can be about status quo in everyday life. Um, so I conducted about 10 workshops and uh, had around 60 participants. Most of them are Chinese. So I think I need to give a bit of introduction on the workshop because compared to many ways to collect data, especially in qualitative research, the workshop is requires long hours devotion from participants. Usually a workshop lasts for two afternoons, eight hours, so it's very intense and uh, quite demanding <laughs> uh, for participants. So there are three parts. The first is story circle exercise. I have participants sit around me. I will throw out topics uh, to each participant and they will take turns to uh, make up stories uh, in response to my topics. Um, for example, make up a story with three random words. and uh, It's supposed to be a warm-up ex exercise, but the confidence and the oral competence trained in that realm that can be translated into later stages. Second part is the main body of the workshop, video creation. So uh, participants uh, look for photos uh, they feel relevant to, to the topic in their laptops, uh, Facebook uh, pages, so we chat moments. And then they record their voice, narrating uh, a story to the script. Usually they you know, um, uh, write a script in advance. And then they combine the sound and the image uh, to make a, a small movie. And uh, it, this, uh, the, actually most of the time used in this session, uh, was for editing, so there is there was very heavy editing uh, during the session. And uh, after each video was finalized, I played the videos to all the all the participants in the workshop. So through conducting those uh, workshops, I tried to develop a storytelling approach to uh, digital self-representation. I try to look at three kinds of narratives that emerged in the process of digital storytelling. Uh, the first, of course, is a migrant narrative in first person. So I wanted to find out if uh, there, are, there were anti-hegemonic uh, stories that emerged from their statements on migration in their stories. And I also look at researcher narrative and uh, technology user narrative to see the uh, how the roles of researcher and the role of uh, softwares and device uh, played in shaping the self-representation. The, the workshops contributed to two case studies in two countries. The first study was a workshop conducted here in Perth. So this story is about uh, the, a Chinese uh, international student uh, um, uh, traveling around the country and uh, trying out new experiences. The participation in uh, WA encountered both uh, 
dynamics and the challenges. Uh, when I approached uh, Chinese migrants, uh, whether temporary or uh, permanent, or whether uh, professional or coming with a family, uh, or uh, educational, uh, they were very uh, dis disinterested at hearing the proposal that, oh, you will um, uh, please uh, come to my workshop. It will be an all Chinese uh, filmmaking workshop on migration. And uh, I think uh, it has two reasons. Uh, first is uh, uh, most uh, 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 most of migrants I approached uh, were enjoyed a kind of an elitist position in the in Australia because they don't have any uh, urgent uh, uh, you know urgent uh, financial or social or ethnic racial stress uh, that need, they need to address in a video form, or uh, and uh, and also they. Uh, many of, and also they don't have this. Uh, the, the, it's, uh, the notion of Chinese migrant is very dispersed. It's very hard to, uh, you know, people will think, oh, are you going to invite Malaysian Chinese? Are you going to? So this uh, uh, idea is very vague. So people don't, you know, even a person likes to be with uh, Chinese, they need to know exactly what kind of Chinese you're going to invite. So uh, and another. Uh, reason is that most Chinese, uh, when they came here, they uh, uh, they experienced a, a downward social mobility. So they uh, compared with their life, previous life in China, they don't have many friends here. So everything costs an effort. Even attending the workshop, they need, some of them need to think about, oh, where should I put my kids during the workshop? Where, uh, how can I, where to take a bus uh, to the Curtin University? So all these uh, actually um, pose a challenge to their attendance. Um, but it was uh, kind of interesting that uh, some uh, participants, uh, some migrants came to me saying that, Jan, could you hold a workshop or to include some non-Chinese? I'm so interested to meet non-Chinese friends and practice my English. So it proved to be effective, you know, when I uh, said, there will be people from different countries in the workshop. And then I did attract a lot of Chinese to come. Um, during the, the story, and this cross-cultural interaction proved to be, um, you know, um, you know it, people really were really drawn to this uh, uh, English speaking and uh, multicultural workshop uh, during the round, especially during the round uh, of story circle, uh, people uh, after the after the games, they felt most Chinese felt that they had a big improvement in self-expression in English, both in their language ability and confidence and social skills. During the video creation, most participants were very uh, devoted and they were very perfectionist. So. Uh, before the workshop, they said, oh, I don't have much time to spend on it. And after, uh, when they were in the workshop, they, they always asked for more time, more time uh, to finalize the video. However, during video creation, when people really have the you know, opportunities to freely interact with each other, Chinese uh, people withdrew into their small uh, Mandarin-speaking group and uh, um, didn't reach out. Uh, so when I asked them, they still said, oh, oh my English is not good, my, uh, I'm not good at socializing. And they sometimes they uh, would uh, racialize non-Chinese. They would say, uh, uh, could you next time, could you please invite uh, more uh, native speakers of American and European origins? <laughs> uh, because their English would be better. And uh, uh, after workshops, there were two participants who came to me separately uh, asking for additional workshops, but one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so it actually surprised me because I thought uh, they had enough, <laughs> you know, uh, they had put in enough hours in, the, in this process. And uh, the case, they, they said they really want an extra workshop because they wanted to, they really have a story they really want to make into a video and share with family and friends. So the workshop turned out to be self-sustainable and it had a brief afterlife. Uh, 
<laughs> and then, uh, but in the video distribution stage, you know, uh, two participants were quite taken aback from the idea that the video will be played to the whole group. And uh, they said, they said, oh, it's for privacy reasons. Actually, one person made a video about past relationships. It's really a private life, a private privacy. But the other person actually uh, did a self-censorship because he uh, he made a video uh, quite challenging his uh, cold country. Uh, so uh, it's his private thoughts that it's actually not privacy, but his private thoughts that uh, might challenge the authority. Um, the stories uh, made from the workshops, I mean, mainly I mean the Chinese uh, participants' stories, made in the workshop displayed their life in Australia. According to the content, I classify them into three groups. And the first group is letter stories. It's made by the Chinese young students. They were very consistent, all of them made uh, letter stories about their letter time, traveling around the country to singing spots, uh, trying out the local food, uh, celebrating festivals with their Chinese friends. And these stories demonstrate a tourist central visitor, which is a modern lifestyle you know, proposed by Dickman Bowman. Uh, so they, they, they were uncertain if they could stay here after they graduate. So, they, did, they didn't get very engaged with the local community, and they didn't uh, grow very attached uh, to Australia. Uh, and for me, they really looked like tourists rather than students. The second uh, group of stories is autobiographical stories made by professional migrants. So these stories are much more aspirational. It's about life journey, which took them to Australia and uh, uh, took them to personal achievements. Uh, so they recounted their life experience back to when they were in China and back to when they first came here. The third group is called anecdotal stories. It's about small encounters and happenings, um, which they told in such a humorous and uh, self-laughing manner. Actually, these stories were mostly about adversity, were well, the only stories about adversity. So they encountered a lot of hardships and difficulties in life, um, but they were po still positive about life here. For example, a lady uh, told about her mispronouncing uh, honey as holy, uh, mistaking dog food as human meal when she first came here. Um, yeah, so uh, it was uh, they were the humorous stories. So combining, you know, the three groups, I argue that uh, these stories demonstrate an agency view that spoke back to the entrenched uh, welfare view on international migration. These uh, stories show that uh, their storytellers are not uh, dependent on the social economic gains or from the society or dependent on any you know, on the government or on any people. They were they showed they were very independent. They can grapple with the difficulties on their own. They broaden their own visions. They pursue their own careers. And for me, these stories are very much less heard in Australia, for example, and Western, Western societies at large. So then I move on to the second case study, which was uh, uh, done in Zhejiang, China. Zhejiang is a province, uh, it's a, one of the wealthiest uh, provinces in China. It is located in the uh, southeastern coast, the coastline, and uh, it actually saw the first sprout of capitalism in China uh, back in China's Yuan Dynasty. So uh, most uh, many students came to this uh, came to a university. So uh, in this case study, I recruited mainly interprovincial students who students who moved from one province to another, um, and uh, they were all from one university located in Zhejiang province. So that's about uh, 
a, 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 a student uh, coming from a northern province in China to the southern province in Zhejiang, and uh, before she graduated, she went to uh, uh, different cities uh, uh, to look for job opportunities and ideal living environment. So participation also met some uh, challenges, but besides challenges, I think I was, uh, I think the dynamic was more important because um, actually since uh, 1978, when China resumed its uh, uh, college entrance exam, university students actually became a very substantial portion of domestic migrants uh, moving, flooding into different major cities in China and uh, became the very important workforce uh, in, that, in those cities. However, local authorities always uh, believe that uh, students are still like tasked and uh, uh, temporary migrant, uh, temporary and useless, you know, they're uncontributing uh, members of the local society. Um, actually, uh, because they are well educated, so it's very, it has been very easy for them to settle down and get the uh, official permanent residency in the society, in the local society. Um, uh, in the, however, in the official uh, discourse, when you mention, oh, actually there is a migrant group called the Chinese uh, University Students, people will feel very confused how to categorize them. Because uh, in the local discourse, uh, there are only two categories of internal migrants. One is called uh, permanent residency with holding, holding the official household registration. The other category is floating population. Uh, which, which actually covered a very wide range. It covers the university students. It also covers rural migrant workers who are very the most disadvantaged group in the society. So I feel that we do need to single out uh, Chinese university students as a distinctive, uh, as a you know unique migrant group to talk about their experience and their identity, and they are surely the rightful authors of domestic mobility in China. I also met some challenges. The first is, uh, first was when I, uh, because I was not a student or uh, staff to the university I, I was visiting, um, I had limited access to the equipment. Uh, students had to, bring, had to bring their own laptops and uh, smartphones. Also, it was very hard to recruit media students. That university was media focused, and the students mostly learned their video creation skills when they were in year one. So digital storytelling appeared to them as a very basic you know, video production activity. Some of them, uh, you know, from a technology-based view, it's not very attractive for media learners. And also there was a privacy issue. A girl came to me saying, oh, it's too private to show to people. Actually, he was, being, he was afraid that he, his very straightforward view on internal migration in her story would be challenged by other participants. The stories produced in Zhejiang province uh, remained what uh, uh, remained our ideas about China's southern areas. Before introducing the stories, I have to give you some background of the geo-advantage discourse in China. Now, since China uh, launched its uh, economic reform and opening up policy in 1978 or 1979, um, the mastermind uh, behind this policy called China's leader at the time, Deng Xiaoping, uh, proposed a national strategy called letting some people get rich first. So it means uh, um, he believes that some people, the, uh, you know, part of the population located in advantaged, advantageous uh, transportation uh, locations, uh, like uh, along the southern and the eastern coastline, they have more opportunities to attract Western investment and uh, uh, 
nurtures the market economy. So when they get rich, they can transfer their skills and also help uh, the poorer areas in China's mainland. So even now, China is now in a post-reform era uh, when the economy has slowed down and uh, many uh, second tier and third tier cities has caught up in infrastructure and the job opportunities. So this course is per has persistent. Um, these students came to Hangzhou with, oh, actually with the advice from their family, uh, their relatives, and their uh, teachers, uh, saying that, oh, there will be a better life there, uh, you will have better job opportunity. Uh, and even in the recent One Belt, One Road initiative, uh, geo advantage is still very important. Uh, Mr. Xi said, oh, we should make use of the uh, geo advantage of port cities. Um, so this, this has been a myth. You know, it used to be something really true, really pragmatic, but now it has been a myth that has driven uh, domestic migration till today. There are three, three groups of stories uh, made. The first I call, uh, according to their destination of uh, migration, uh, I label them as North-South stories, uh, multi-destination and getaway stories. North-South stories is about uh, uh, students moving their life from northern provinces to south. So these stories were about uh, later times uh, they spent on um, going to the theme park in Hangzhou, trying out street food stores, and uh, traveling to the ancient style uh, tourist towns like Wuzhen. They were looking for the cultural sounds, some culture, which, uh, uh, which was very, you know, which was renowned for its uh, uh, being very delicate, uh, very reserved, and, uh, but actually through their stories, the distinctive southern culture was nowhere to see. It was all about the consumerist style of spending on you know, products. And uh, uh, actually, the landscapes were all the you know, product of uh, the, the outcome of globalization and China's engagement with the market economy. For example, the um, the street store, the street food stores, and theme parks. Uh, one girl encountered in Hangzhou can also be found in her home city in Qingdao. The second group of stories is multi-destination stories. Um, these stories are about just like the story I played to you are about students before the graduation traveling to cities uh, to look for an ideal place to live in, and the unanimous ending of these stories are no place to settle down. Because there are always unforeseeable frustrations, or whether people-wise, or job-wise, or living condition-wise. So it actually makes a counter story uh, to the narrative that a good city is a terminal of happiness, is a grain of pasture. And the third group of stories is getaway stories. A student made a, a micro documentary using museum photos about the past of his home city. I think it was about uh, the 1970s China. At that time, China was very poor, and the people wore very similar clothes, uh, way men, women look alike, and. Uh, uh, had very few entertainment activities. People went to theater, market, sports meeting together. However, for that, uh, for that uh, student born after 1995, he felt it was attractive to him compared to today's life. And he, was, he felt people were, at that time, more spiritually pure and uh, uh, were not so materialistic. Um, so he, he, he said he would refrain from uh, settling down in major cities. He would rather choose a smaller city. So all these stories combined uh, demonstrate a decentering move uh, from the geo myth that I just introduced. 
And uh, it mostly tells that uh, people, they all have choices, and they don't need to base, on, base their choice just on the cities. So I believe through this uh, storytelling activity, uh, digital storytelling is potential to be a practice of cultural citizenship for migrants. Despite, the, despite those challenges and constraints, digital storytelling provided Chinese migrants with quality access to new media technologies. So when I asked them to use their original uh, voice and original photos, actually their creativity and originality and their unique voice was guaranteed. And because of the technology advancement, we don't need to rely on uh, computers, so we can use smartphones, can use laptops. So the institutional support of a device actually was uh, was not that important as before, and uh, so institutions doesn't um, enjoy the privilege of intervening this activity. And uh, I think it's also interesting that it uh, mobilized the people's digital archives, uh, because after we randomly take photos on a daily basis, we barely have an opportunity to look back on those photos again. And these and those photos of meaning making life actually was very short. But in this digital storytelling, the meaning making was extended and people start to reflect and be critical with these with those, you know, photos and the random act of photography. And the energy during the workshop was contagious, was very uh, you know, it in the formed a kind of synergy that moved everyone to uh, try their best. And in the stories, I believe the migrants uh, portray themselves not as recipients of welfare, but they laid claims to dignity and visibility. This was in, consistent with uh, Roseldo's uh, uh, arguments on cultural citizenship, although that argument was specifically oriented towards Latino Americans. So in these stories, they show their distinctive, uh, unique experience. And uh, it was really the first step before you know, the wide uh, acceptance of mutual difference uh, in the public realm. And by creating the, their own original uh, symbolic, uh, symbolic resource on uh, migration, they became self-informed citizens rather than being informed by experts and the authorities. And it's very important at the end of the activity, they do affirm that they are migrants and they are the rightful speakers on the topic of migration. So I think it, that, that tells us that this participatory practice should be a sustained effort rather than a one-off. So there are, you know, things we need to think about in further research on this practice because we really uh, think about how to experiment with different non-digital resources. We always uh, think of, of upgrading the technology for the practice, but uh, you know we can incorporate more local elements into the practice and also make the practice. Uh, in different forms, not necessarily in a workshop form. And also the privacy concern were, was very notable in both case studies. Uh, it's not a, just about the safety of the online environment. It's also about the human, dis, uh, human instinct of uh, being afraid to be agreed with, disagreed with. Uh, but, you know, by like Michael Casey said the other day, this uh, it's by establishing these uh, echo, echo chambers that we only share with the stories so with like-minded people, it's not good for us to eliminate the bias on issues. So that's all about my research. Thank you very much.